Um, and uh, we'll be focusing on different aspects of uh, qualities that we are finding to be very prominent in the minds of people as they reimagine the church. And those are a church that is faithful and reflective, contemplative, anti-racist, mutual, contextual, and innovative. And today we're going to focus on the reflective, contemplative component of that. And uh, one of the things that moved us to design these sessions the way that we have is um, that there's been a, a great abundance of opportunities for folks to share ideas and hear from amazing leaders in our church, but maybe not as many opportunities for, for us to really engage in taking some of the elements of what we're hearing and learning from one another and use having some framework for designing blueprints or visions of how we might put these to work in our different congregational contexts. And so this series that we're hosting is going to have a lot of ideas in the first several sessions. And then the last sessions, people will have the opportunity to be coached through designing some ideas for, for ministries using the different components of this. And we'll be sending out um, lots of uh, documentation of the ideas um, that are generated through these groups over um, the next few months um, until we get to sort of midway into Advent. Um, so that's just a little description of what the series is about. And, um, I also wanted just to say um, a little bit about the Society for the Increase of the Ministry. Um, SEM has for 163 years been um, both a scholarship organization and a scholarly organization. Today we are really a learning community of thought leaders who are cultivating wisdom for this massive adaptive challenge that's required to really secure the future of the Christian faith. And uh, we lead that process through recruitment and scholarships, but also through consulting and convening and publications. So that's a word, a little word about what Sim is up to these days. I'd like to welcome today three of my absolute favorite people in the world <laughs> who are just wonderful conversation partners. And um, I really can never say enough about how much I enjoy um, really my opportunities to have deep, rich, prayerful conversation with um, Stuart Higginbotham, Mark Grayson, and Kate Eaton, who are all here with us today. Um, I'll start by introducing Kate. Um, so, Kate is a fourth generation Coloradan and a lifelong Episcopalian who now resides in Miami, Florida with her husband, Bishop Peter Eaton. Um, today we're really included Kate um, because of the work she has done founding Mishka, M-I-S-H-K-H-A-H. Um, she is a musician and an artist, and she helped design um, a really innovative, amazing congregation that moved, or worshiping community within the context of the cathedral in Denver, Colorado. And she works with churches and seminaries and individuals, um, helping them develop uh, liturgies and worship experiences that really engage the senses and open the heart. She's also just uh, de has produced amazingly beautiful CDs and the latest one is King of Love which is just really sonic bomb for the soul. So thank you so much for being with us Kate. 
We also have with us today um, Mark Grayson, who um, is a, a longtime colleague. If you all read our publication, The Future of the Faith, you will have read um, Mark's wonderful uh, book review of this book, Contemplation and Community, which um, was published last year and edited by Stuart Higginbotham, our third guest. Um, so Mark is the newly elected junior warden at Trinity Church in Southport, Connecticut, which is about to celebrate its 300th anniversary and has been doing a lot of visioning about the future leading up to that great milestone. Mark is a lay leader of the church who's a former Hollywood agent, a producer of children's programming and nonprofit executive in education. He's an entrepreneur. He's married and has two sons. And um, he also writes frequently for something called the Good Men Project. And I really commend to you his writing um, for the Good Men Project. Also, um, my really dear friend, Stuart Higginbotham, who, among many other things, is the rector of um, Grace Church in Gainesville, Georgia, and the Diocese of Atlanta. And um, Grace is a thousand-member congregation um, that's doing some really incredible um, this kind of pioneering work in the area that we're talking about today. And um, as I mentioned, Stuart, uh, is the editor of Contemplation and Community, but he's also really kind of a leader in this whole movement um, in the Episcopal Church to explore ways to deepen our contemplative practice and, and what it would mean to put that at the core of, of what it means to be a faith community. Um, so welcome to Stuart as well. <laughs> it's great to have you all here. So um, we're going to, the format for today, we're going to, I'm going to lead us in a conversation with our three guests. Um, I'm going to get the conversation rolling and then I'm going to kind of let them run with it about um, maybe 15, 20 minutes from now, we're going to bring that to a close and we're going to go into random small groups and uh, um, Jim Goodman, my colleague, who's going to start us off with the centering reflection in a few minutes, is going to give us a couple of um, kind of self-awakening questions to take with us into our small group discussions. We'll come back and harvest some of that collective wisdom, and then we'll close with a, with a personal story about how contemplation and practice has shaped one of our vocations from Mark, um, from Mark Grayson. So that gives you a little bit of a sense about our time together and I'm hoping we'll be finished and the whole of this will take about 75 minutes. So Jim, would you like to start us with um, uh, kind of setting the stage and the framework and give us our centering reflection? Good afternoon everyone. As a way of creating deliberate reflective space, I want to do a little reading from the poet Rumi. It's called Listening. And listening in our practices uh, that we've done over a decade now. Um, listening in living in the green has functioned as kind of the bedrock practice. Um, we do a, a module called Storytelling and Holy Listening but we will always emphasize to participants that listening is really the more important. <laughs> listening is the disposition that we bring to prayer and beyond prayer, listening is the disposition that we bring as a sacred presence to the rest of life. So let's get ourselves into a kind of frame of, of that listening and hear what Rumi has to say. What is the deep listening? Sama is a greeting from the secret ones inside the heart. A letter. The branches of your intelligence 
grow new leaves in the wind of this listening. The body reaches a peace. Rooster sound comes, reminding you of your love for dawn. The reed flute and the singer's lips, the knack of how spirit breathes into us, becomes as simple and ordinary as eating and drinking. The dead rise with the pleasure of listening. If someone can't hear a trumpet melody, sprinkle dirt on his head and declare him dead. Listen and feel the beauty of your separation, the unsayable absence. There is a moon inside every human being Learn to be companions with it. Give more of your life to this listening. As brightness is to time, so you are to the one who talks to the deep ear in your chest. I should sell my tongue and buy a thousand ears when that one steps near and begins to speak. Thank you, Jim. So Mark, I wanted to talk with you a little bit about um, the journey that Trinity Southport has been on. I think it's a journey that maybe a number of congregations around the country are on. Um, kind of revisioning and reimagining the church um, and, uh, and finding yourselves discovering this very interesting calling and vocation as you all were listening deeply um, to where the spirit was moving you. So could I just ask you to tell us a little bit about this experience that you all have been having? Sure. A couple years ago, we, um, we got started on a strategic planning process as, as parishes sometimes do. And um, we, are, we are truly blessed to have a number of um, members who have, you know, had long careers in finance and media and consumer products, all the you know, consulting, all the things that you would hope to have wonderful, smart people do. Um, and um, we, you know, tackled it as much as you would in any kind of um, business or not nonprofit setting. Um, but we very early on recognized that um, our goal wasn't, of course, to maximize shareholder value uh, or to, you know, maximize social impact, but that really what our goal was, was to somehow increase the spiritual vitality of the community. Um, and, uh, of course, um, devise a plan that would um, not only enable that, but also... Um, ensure the sustainability of a parish that's been around for three centuries um, because we were already then beginning to anticipate the upcoming anniversary. Um, and we, we, we did all the things that you normally do, you know, focus groups and um, all kinds of sort of uh, problem definition, opportunity definition, all those things that we've, we've all um, been through. Um, and we devised a, a plan in the in phase one that that we implemented, but we very quickly realized that um, it wasn't enough. That uh, what we were doing, even if we did it a lot better, was just not going to accomplish what we were truly aiming for. And so we um, we decided to try and figure out how to try and lift um, this process and, and, and turn it into something entirely different. And as, 
you often do, I, when you sort of push back from the table and said, you know, are we asking the right questions? Um, and, and it turned out that we weren't, um, that what we were really doing was trying to make a, an institution that we knew and loved better, perfect it the way it was. And that what we really had to do was challenge ourselves to, to be bolder than that to think about church in a new way um, and, um, and try our hardest to identify um, the deep unspoken um, needs of our parishioners and our community um, so that we might be able to reframe or reimagine the church um, as something else. And I, I don't know exactly how it happened, um, but in our sort of discontent with where we, where we were and where we were going, we ended up one afternoon um, having a, a range of conversations about, you know, how do we transform this? Um, and all of a sudden it kind of just hit us out of nowhere that really what we were aiming for was something entirely different. It was, it was, creating a spiritual center, a place that people, not so much a place, if, but a metaphorical place that, um, that brought people together so that they might advance in their spiritual growth, that they might experience the genuine, authentic, open-hearted connections that um, a community um, will have, and that somehow this, this unleashing of the spirit amongst us um, would probably, we thought, take form um, as a series of actions um, in our community. We happen to live next to um, a greatly impoverished city by the name of Bridgeport. And though we're um, very active in Bridgeport, um, we all have felt for a long time that there was more to be done. Um, and so we, um, we, with that sort of very big, broad vision in hand, started to um, ideate all kinds of things that we could do. Um, and then we put that into a, um, a survey that not only gave us the opportunity to gather insight, um, into what was really important to our parishioners. But it was also designed to help them articulate um, from their hearts what it was they were hoping and dreaming for that they weren't yet um, getting um, at our church. And what we discovered um, was that we have, of course, a community that is deeply um, engaged in the life of the spirit, um, you know, worship and sacred music and liturgy and the various pro programs are incredibly important, 80th percentile um, to this group. But we also discovered that that very same group is yearning for something more. And, um, and it turns out that what they're what they're looking for is um of course opportunities to gather where we can celebrate being together and 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 enjoy life um through various sorts of sort of entertainments and things but beyond that they would love to be um, more engaged in forums um that are helping us um, better understand the issues of the day and how we can um, take action um, in order to try and solve some of these problems. But the other thing that I thought was so interesting is that even though these many of our parishioners are deeply embedded in their practice, they are really interested in learning more on their seekers. They would love to be involved in um, ancient wisdom um, from um, other faith traditions. 
so that we might be able to uh, incorporate into our practice, um, our Christian practice, um, the set of understandings and tools that um, have been around for the millennia. Um, and, and one last thing that happened was that we, we in the survey, um, did a categorization. We got everybody to self-identify where they were in their um, stage of spiritual growth. Um, and we used Renewal Works um, uh, taxonomy um, for that. Um, and while self-reporting isn't necessarily all that um, reliable, what we discovered was that the people who were early in their journey um, exploring um, and growing, um, even people who identified as spiritual but non-religious and were members of our parish, um, were very much interested in the same things um, as um, the parishioners who were um, deep and centered. So um, it's, it's been a, a, a super exciting uh, moment for us um, where I think we will take up the challenge of trying to create uh, a, uh, a center, um, a sanctuary on the sound. Thank you so much, Mark. That is so interesting to hear this sort of process that you've been through and this journey. And I'd like to turn now to, to Stuart, um, who is the rector of a congregation that has been on a similar journey um, and has had to think with his parishioners about how do we actually live into the vision that Trinity has, you know, has sort of arrived at at this point. So, Stuart, what, what are you finding is the way, the way into actually um, implementing this and moving in this direction? Yeah, thank you. And it's so good to have a chance to be here. And I want to build on, Mark, I loved that phrase when you said to unleash the spirit. That I jotted that down on my piece of paper because I think that's been our uh, experience at Grace has been we're getting very close to our two, two um, hundred years instead of three. So we have a bit to go to catch up with you. But one of the things that that it really helped us do, which it might help us to do in this space, was to actually have a working definition of what contemplation is. Because what we've engaged with as a, as a parish is really the sense of moving away from a program maintenance model toward one that really speaks to what you're talking about, Mark, and what Kate will talk about as well, which is this unleashing the spirit. You know, and I think our working definition of contemplation as a parish is really this, what is an, an um, experience of the presence of God that's nurtured by these practices that cultivate a certain stillness and quietness in our heart that allows us to listen. So how we've done this at Grace, it really echoes what, what Mark has done and what the team at um, Trinity has done has been how can we invite these different circles of people within the congregation to risk naming out loud how we've been stuck in maintaining our programs and really being honest about where our stress is. What we learned was that so much of our stress was about finding uh, replacements to keep existing programs propped up and moving forward. So, so much energy would go toward if someone uh, retired or moved or even died, so much stress went toward finding someone to pop in that hole to keep that program running the way that it has always ran. And what we have done over the past seven years that's really at the heart of it, is to say what would happen if we stepped back and really looked at whatever the program might be and asked ourselves, what is the spirit 
really inviting us to explore, which means what are we being invited to let go of? And what are we being invited to take on perhaps in a very new way? So you can, you know, imagine along with that as a set of um, kind of necessary frameworks in terms of what um, language do we use? How do we talk about this? Because the church as an um, institution has not talked about this, so to speak, for a very long time. So how do we talk with each other about this? How do we name out loud um, what our resistances are to that level of being vulnerable with each other? Um, how do we name out loud what really is our ego's tendency to grasp and say, you know, I had this really good idea 25 years back and I really want to hold on to it, although I'm the only person who seems to have any interest at all in keeping this moving forward. So I think these are these common, you know, across different contexts, kind of an undergirding, if you will, around these, what we're calling these elements of a contemplative uh, reformation within a congregational context that really invite us to wonder what risks that we're being invited to take as a congregation and how we're being invited to step more fully into our um, imaginations, which is why I love Kate and being able to work with Kate so much is the, you know, the space that Kate invites around, you know, this integrated mind and heart posture of really leaning into this prayerful space. So, so Kate and Stuart, can you describe a little bit for us the kind of like what it's like to come to to a to a Stuart and Kate retreat, or what is it that you're actually engaging with folks? Well, I was only blessed to do it once with Kate over three or three or four days. But you know, Kate, the work that you've built, I think, is phenomenal. Thank you. Well, I, um, I was also blessed uh, to get to be partnered with Stuart um, and just had no idea the um, portals that um, he was going to open for me and for um, those who came on the journey with us at Sewanee. And um, I think it, one of the hardest things I found in doing this work is um, is knowing when you just have to go for it, and when um, and and th there's a lot of you know talking and thinking and discerning that's so important. Um, but at some point, you just kind of got to go for it, and you just have to say, "Let's just try it." And um, and you know, you watch people's eyes around the room get like this, and I've seen this a lot in the work I've done across the country, you know, directors of music who kind of find the door and like slip out the back <laughs> or, uh, you know, a priest who says, gosh, um, when we first started talking about this, I thought this was a great idea, but I'm not so sure now at all. It seems really messy and it seems, and, you know, and then needing to kind of say, it's going to be okay. Um, and, you know, let's just try it. And, if it's terrible, we just won't do it again. And so, you know, there's all of that, I think, involved. Um, and, and then it's really exciting when you do try it and you discover things that you never knew would actually manifest themselves in the experience. And you're all together in that going, how did that happen? We didn't plan that. Um, or the other things that you planned and worked really hard and then you're just ducking for cover because you're thinking, wow, that just doesn't work at all. So, you know, it's just this combination of, of things. Um, but I would say that with Stuart, when we um, had our weekend together uh, at Sewanee with probably 20, 25 individuals, um, it was just, remarkable to me how we started with Stuart's um, leadership and coaching about contemplation and prayer 
and then um, we moved to an actual service in their chapel um, and then we actually had a workshop the next day and people began to put pen to paper and break off into little groups and um, come up with ideas themselves and you know it was very rich so thank you so uh, maybe um, this would be a good time for everyone to be able to spend some time in small groups um, just talking a little bit about um, sort of, you know, why you chose to come to, to this gathering, this little mini retreat today, what intrigued you about the topic, um, and what, what you are in the process of creating or hoping to create around, um, you know, deep contemplative space. Uh, in faith communities. Is, does anybody else want to add anything from our leaders around, um, uh, you know, sort of how we might want to frame this conversation that we're going into small groups to have? I would just say, I think that context is key, you know, like Kate said, you know, and with Mark as well, that each of our contexts are so different. But in so many ways, what undergirds them are the same uh, seeking and searching elements like Mark talked about. When, they, when, you, when you step into this space and you start engaging on that level of the heart, what you find out is that we're all kind of in this zone or this sphere of yearning and searching. And that, I think, is a very key piece of this to say, how does that universal searching become embodied within your particular context. So to kind of, you know, affirm that and say, you know. Absolutely. So um, we're going to take uh, from now until uh, 2.45. So a little 11 minutes or so. Um, in our small groups, just talking amongst ourselves. And if you want to take some notes um, about any sort of um, places in the conversation that sort of have particular energy for your group, um, we're gonna we're gonna you know share some of the harvest from our conversations in the chat box when we come back. And those notes might be helpful for that. Or we're also gonna invite a couple of people to you know to speak. Um, what uh, what was rich for them in their conversations when we come back and those notes might help you also um, decide whether you want to uh, raise your hand and, and do that with the big group when you come back or not. So um, Mike Longworth, our um, helpful <laughs> tech assistant at SIM, is going to just put us all into small groups for about 10 minutes to chat. And Jim. Yeah. Um, I've posted in the chat box a couple of what we call self-awakening questions. They are questions that are sort of intuitively posed to you. They don't have straight yes or no or rational answers. <clears throat> they are in the chat box and they are these. How are you or might you create space for the one who steps near in your context and begins to speak? How do you develop a listening culture? And the sub question for that is, why would you want to include this in your vision for a new church, for a new world? So those might be catalysts to your conversation. Otherwise, join them to the thoughts that are already active for you. Wonderful. Okay, everyone have fun. We'll see you in a few. Welcome back, everybody. I hope you enjoyed your conversation. Um, so here, this is the part we have an opportunity to enter into the chat box. Um, just phrases, words, questions, themes that came up, just everybody sort of harvesting our ideas together in the chat, in the chat box. 
and sort of what's on our minds, what was coming up out of the conversations, maybe even some of some of the thoughts you were having as you were listening to the speakers. Um, just a chance for us to kind of harvest all of our ideas. So I'm going to, uh, you know, let's just go for it. I'm going to, I'm going to start, um, you know, by saying, um, It just we can all be typing here. This is just, it's not one at a time. It's just, yeah, let's see. Right, this is great. So I'm seeing, you know, um, the connection between contemplation and fear. Um, Fear coming up, yeah, a lot. How do we touch the depth of fear and guilt that is in us regarding racism? How important contemplation is on that? We're going to talk about that some more in our next session. Um, the opportunity COVID has given us to rethink things, different ways of living our lives, so many different areas. Hmm. Interesting, I've seen a lot of people talking about the connection between contemplative practice as we prepare to address racism at a new level and its importance in terms of navigating change. Big themes in this time we're living through. Would anybody like to talk a little bit about, um, share with the big group? Um, some of what you were discussing in your small group. Is there anybody here who'd like to, to share with the whole group um, something that seemed important that was being said in your small group? I just really want to lift up something that Susan said because I think it connects with that thread around the link between contemplation and racism, which at its heart, I think has to do with honoring the personhood of someone who has been seen as other. And I love the way that Susan said this. She said, you know, in, in a parish, it's, it's sometimes the case that some people have always expected to be listened to. <laughs> and it's a practice for them to listen to someone else without that reciprocation being necessarily given. So it's this humility and being vulnerable. And that to me is the link between those two, between contemplative practice and honoring the dignity of every human being is that to actually see the other person as connected with you. 
So thank you for that, Susan. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you. I, I just want to th say that um, I just am so grateful to be in this to, to be in this forum today because um, we are struggling at St. Paul's with listening and to be with people who are also struggling that way and thinking about deepening faith through listening um, is so important. And uh, it's nice to be with people who are practicing because I'm definitely a newbie at this. Thank you. I know um, Jim and I have been really helped um, through the years by um, studying with Parker Palmer and just familiarizing ourselves with a lot of his work, um, his Quaker background, mm -hmm. um, you know, really um, is such a gift. Uh, there's such a profound tradition of the practice of listening to one another in community in the Quaker tradition. And, um, you know, I still, I go back to his work all the time. Um, the Center for, um, what is it? The Center for cre Creative, for Contemplation and Renewal is what it, Courage and Renewal. I don't know. Courage and Renewal. Center for Courage and Renewal is another resource that um, you know, has so much wisdom about the elements of how you can design um, a space that really lends itself to, um, to allowing what he calls the shy soul um, to kind of come out of hiding. Um, and he's just, I mean, he's just a font of wisdom, I think, on a lot of, a lot of practices that can be incorporated in creating and holding that kind of space. I know I'm really struck by the work of Catherine Meeks um, in Atlanta and the, you know, the Center for Racial Healing and her, how deeply she is steeped in Jungian psychology and practice and um, her whole approach to racial healing having just enormous depth in terms of how, how deeply this is embedded in our, our souls and our psyches. And I think that's another reason that contem contemplative practice um, is so important to the kind of racial healing work, at least as she's approaching it. Um, I mean, it's all about healing, really, isn't it? Of all kinds. I, I really, I very much agree that it's all about healing, Courtney. Yeah, um, I just posted in the chat that a resource that, that's really helped me to understand this and has some resources about it is a book by Resma Menachem called um, My Grandmother's Hands. The subtitle is um, Racialized Trauma and the Pathway to Mending Our Hearts and Bodies. Mm -hmm. and, um, and he's saying, I think he's a trauma counselor, he's saying that all of us, both black and white, are carrying trauma in our bodies. Um, um, from the racialized history of the country. Um, and that until we can let our bodies settle, um, we're not really going to be able to change. And that's, I think, the same thing as the contemplative practice. It takes you to the same place. But it names more clearly than I've seen before um, that I, I need to come to terms with what it is to be white and to love myself and to, other, and to love other white people. Um, that when I do that, I'll discover that folks who are not white have known this all the time. You know, mm -hmm. It's not like I need to include people, it's I need to begin to become human, um, okay. which is the task. Mm -hmm. So true, thank you so much for that resource. Um, Jim, you were saying earlier about also that this is about a type of presence. Yeah, Can you we, say more about that? 
It's a matter, uh, this was an earlier discussion of today. We talked about the kind of evolving that we've had to do as church since the COVID hit and working, and working through different mediums. But it applies to spaces that are affected by the virus like Zoom, but it also applies in general. Um, it's a different kind of presence that we all um, instinctually lean toward because we know what it's like to convene formally. We know what, it likes, what it's like to be highly conscious of ceremonial um, perfection, and that's a good thing, and it's in our bodies. But we also know and what at least yearn for, if we don't know as well, as well as we might, a sense of presence that is kind of radiates back and forth between those who convene and those who participate. And um, part of our ambition here as an organization is to kind of repeatedly convene that kind of presence, those sorts of conversations where people are reminded of the sacred. That's, I guess, you know, to not plug too deeply, that's why we're calling them retreats because it's sort of a, an advancement on cultivating the presence, uh, lifting up practices of deep listening, um, and even getting to the stories that are the basis for directing our lives. Courtney, that makes me think of something in Kate's work. So in a Mishka service, there's this part that was so powerful for me because my daughter, you know, being, she was, she had just turned 13, I think whenever we did that. And, you know, every 13 year old struggles. They're like the epitome of the struggling human being. <laughs> and there's this moment in that worship framework called the Via Sacra, where people take their shoes off and actually walk around the church to these different stations and actually touch and feel. And I don't know if I was supposed to do it, but I took this little piece, I stole it, because it had on there this little sign and it had in writing, she paints with all the colors. And, it, and I froze and just wept because I thought how important it was for our daughter to have that honored in her own life, that everything fits. You know, so I brought that home and put it on a piece of string and she wears it to school. And hearing you say that, Jim, about presence brought all that back around, mm -hmm. you know, we need these spaces in our lives to be honored and to honor each other. But Kate, thank you for that space and that worship framework. I loved another thing that Kate, that you said about the Anglican tradition. Mark was talking about the richness of this tradition and how many people there are in our midst who have really deep practices. And you would like never guess it, you would never know, you know, people in all kinds of professions, all kinds of lay members of our church, but who've been deep, you know, meditators or contemplative prayer practitioners for decades. And you were saying, you know, that you felt that sometimes in, in the Anglican church that we, we take all this really powerful, um, you know, wisdom that has the ability to really unlock things and unleash things in wild ways. And we, we sort of make it look pretty and polite. <laughs> Can you say that in your own words, what you were talking about there? Because it really resonated with me. Um, you want to unmute. My mother was an Episcopalian and a lot of fun, but she looked very much like an Episcopalian. Uh, you know, in the sense of um, her uh, family in Denver and the little flat shoes and the 
you know, the, the collar up high and, um, and she, my, my father and her, they were both polite and um, socially correct for the most part. And so, um, and I, I suppose for me, when I started doing the work of Mishka, um, I realized that what I was doing might ruffle the feathers of some of the old guard, um, of which my mother was one and was not living at the time. And I began to think, uh-oh, should I do that? And, but then I had enough people around me saying, we need, we need to do this and try this. Um, so I think what uh, Mark was alluding to, which I think is so profound as Stuart is as well, is that um, the whole notion of contemplation, the whole notion of prayer, um, the liturgy itself is, it's just, it's, it drips of um, the, the beauty and the wonder of the tradition that has existed over millennia. And there, there is nothing light or there's not a light beer in there. You know, it's, this is, this is something that has a lot of, of depth and breadth. Um, and, and like the Bible, I mean, it's, it's living. It could, it could take a lifetime or two or three to really penetrate uh, the liturgical um, aspects, the, 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 sac the sacraments, etc. cetera. So um, I, think, I think I'm saying this right. Mark mentioned that it's really, you know, we're at a mother load moment. So because of COVID, because of the tradition that we are so fortunate to live in, the Anglican tradition, and the contemplative practices that are inside of it, around it, um, and that we are living in a time when people really are reaching for help. I mean, um, you know, this is, this is bringing to the surface, probably in all of us, um, a sense of, wow, this is tectonic. And so the mother load, um, I started to see kind of this picture of a pie that is in the oven. And you know how you, you cut those little places in the pie crust so that as it begins to rise, it, the steam can get out. And then you start to see the cherry filling beginning to peek through. And that's maybe about the time you know it's ready and you can't wait to get your piece. So I feel like that's kind of where we are. We're in this moment of um, we've been thinking and pondering and wondering, and maybe this is the time for the Episcopal Church to step forward and, um, and, and, and let go of our polite ways. Our polite ways are important, but if, if they've been doing this to us, we need to share, you know, because we have a gem, we have a diamond. Um, so I don't know if that was the right path, but uh, that's what I was thinking about. Thank you. So um, I think that that sort of segues a bit to saying a little bit about um, where we might go from here with this conversation. So, so, ne so the next conversation, which is two weeks from tomorrow, is, is going to be about anti-racism. Uh, the chair of some scholarship committee, Constance Perry will be a part of it, Miriam McKinney from Forward Movement, Katrina Brown, um, who is leading the National Church's um, work that goes under the name of um, sacred, sacred Ground, um, and myself, and Karen Montano from the Cathedral in Cincinnati, will all be the, the speakers, like, getting the ball rolling on that conversation. And I know that in the case of more than one of those participants, um, contemplative practice and anti-racism work 
goes go hand in hand. So for those of you all who are interested in that part of the conversation we've had today, I would really um, commend joining the next conversation as well. Uh, the, um, in some of the former conversations that we had, there was a lot of energy around um, people who were involved in different ways in agricultural ministries around the church. And as a result of these conversations, um, they called a circle and started to kind of do their own sort of spin-off, um, kind of networked ongoing conversation, uh, comparing notes and learning from each other and the ways that they're engaging agricultural ministries around the church in different contexts. And there's been some thought that we do the same thing for those who are interested in this, um, this kind of uh, contemplative reformation of the church, as Stuart likes to call it, and the movement that's kind of building around that. So we will keep you informed um, as we will, we will compile all the notes from today. There will be a recording that's posted. Everyone who registered for this will get copies of everything coming out of it. And we will keep you informed and also welcome your thoughts um, back to us about how we might continue to create a space for this to be an ongoing conversation. And um, in conclusion, we're just going to hear sort of one kind of public narrative um, from our guest, Mark Grayson, who's going to tell, you know, in just about just the, the time we have left here, about the last eight minutes or so, um, his story of how contemplative practice transformed um, his life and his ministry. Um, so, I will thank you all for coming today, and I invite you to um, listen with the ears of your heart to, to Mark, and um, as uh, Quaker Douglas Steer says, um, that, uh, that the quality of listening to one another's story um, to listen that in that deep, deep way where we are really fully present to hearing one another, um, maybe the greatest gift um, that one human being can offer another. So I invite you to listen now as we close the space um, in that spirit. Well, thank you, Courtney. Um, and Kate, I, um probably should use your remarks about uh, perhaps we need to drop the prim and properness um, of the way in which we do things at the church um, uh, because this story is probably as non-traditional as you might get um, in terms of the way in which my um, spiritual journey uh, took off and some of the practices that I uh, and experiences that I went through uh, on that journey. Um, I should say to everyone that this story um, does actually, uh, as a trigger alert, I should say, um, involve some nudity, and I, uh, I apologize for that. Um, if you find it offensive, um, please do um, mute me. Um, I'll try to signal them when that's over, but um, I think it's pretty tame, um, and I hope nobody is offended. Um, so 40 years ago, um, two things happened that changed my life. Uh, the first thing was that I read Herbert Benson's book, Relaxation Response, and began to meditate for an hour each day. As promised, it worked. I developed a sense of peace that I desperately needed in college. After graduating, I wanted to um, go to India uh, in the worst way, but uh, my parents uh, wisely said no. Um, and so I um, continued to meditate at home. 
But um, all kinds of weird stuff started to happen. Uh, I flew in my dreams. I had strange visions. People's faces melted. And strangers showed up with messages. Uh, I thought I was losing my mind. So uh, I, I, I begged God, please make it stop. The other thing that happened about this time was that in an act of self-preservation, I rejected the norms of what it means to be male that I had grown up with in Texas. I had no interest, none, in the, co in the cowboy code of that state. And I knew that in order to become the kind of guy that I wanted to be, I had to leave it all behind. So I fled to New York City, began a career in advertising, then became a Hollywood agent, and finally a nonprofit education executive. I got married, raised two boys, and worked very hard in several very demanding jobs to make ends meet. Instead of going to India, I went to a string of Episcopal churches, first Heavenly Rest in Manhattan, then St. James in Los Angeles, and now Trinity Southport in Connecticut. Weirdly, my bizarre sp spiritual experiences continued. I felt stalked. It was like God was teeing up a teleprompter with messages that I needed to hear at church. Baffled, I began to write it all down so that no one could accuse me of making it up. I now have hundreds of pages with the fingerprints of God on them. Finally, hitting 50, my life fell apart. And since I had some free time and the universe abhors a void, the spirit went on, on to overdrive. I began meditating again and got back in shape by practicing Bikram yoga, swimming and working out. But then a series of spiritual visors showed up, kind of out of nowhere, including a woman who was a drill sergeant deeply immersed in several Eastern lineages. She told me that I had a problem that all men have, wanting to run the show and call the shots, when what I needed to do was to learn how to surrender, be open, transparent, vulnerable. I really didn't have a clue what she was talking about. So I doubled down on my workout program, but repeated the mantra, thy will be done, morning, noon, and night, and prayed for guidance as to how I could learn how to surrender. After a couple months, a really strange thing happened. I met a young female photographer who was working on a project shooting men in the nude so that they could better understand the impact of the male gaze. I was fascinated by her work. Her ideas so mirrored the lessons that I had been trying to learn my whole life as I reinvented the old, worn out models of masculinity that never served me well. When I asked her what she thought most of the men were getting out of posing for her, without missing a beat, she replied, oh, that's easy. They're learning what it means to surrender, be open, transparent, vulnerable. Of course, she then asked me whether or not I would pose for the project. Terrified, but sensing a direct order from God, I bowed my head and said yes. Posing nude turned out to be a test of whether or not I was willing to put it all on the line, literally, to make a shift. It also turned out to be my passport for another series of spiritual adventures that included, included a series of retreats with an Indian guru to the gurus, a weekend workshop with inner spiritual mystic Mirabai Star, and a Christ moment at Holy Cross Monastery. The infinite blank screen of the eternal present opened up, as well as a tunnel through time and space. I like to joke that because I would not go to India, India came to me. I would have been quite content to leave it here and meditate in seclusion for the rest of my life. 
But it turns out that all that spiritual stuff was just a warm up for the main event. Me Too hit, and I suddenly found myself surrounded by guys who were spinning. A couple buddies convinced me that I had a moral obligation to share my life experience so that other men could benefit. So I submitted an essay on the nude photo shoot to the Los Angeles Review of Books, and it was accepted instantly. It's kind of like winning an Oscar for your first documentary short. Then the publisher of the Good Men Project accepted another essay and asked for a dozen more. I've now published over 30 essays in the last two years and a lit agent is going out with a book proposal. If you had told me 40 years ago that I was going to pose nude to advance a spiritual practice that would give me the strength to help men rebuild their male identities from the inside out, I would have laughed my head off. But here we are today. God certainly works in strange ways, and I am living proof of it. Amen. Thank you, Mark. So beautiful. These personal stories of our journeys are so powerful and so holy. And we really, really thank you for, for sharing that with us. Thank you to everyone who came today. Thank you for the people who helped lead our discussion. Thank you to all the good friends whose faces I see out there. Um, I hope you'll come back for the next one on how, what do we need to do as the Episcopal Church to become an anti-racist denomination? Uh, I'm sure we need more than 75 minutes for that conversation, but at least we'll get started and we'll have another powerful story like Mark's to conclude our next session as well. So thank you. Stay in touch. Um, remember, SEM is a resource we want everyone out there in the church to know about and to avail themselves of. And God bless until we see you again. Bye-bye.